If there's one name that children everywhere for pretty much the last century have heard of, it's Walt Disney. His legacy and influence has reached so far that even people who've never seen his movies have most definitely heard of the man. And while most people look on him with admiration and joy, there are of course people who view him in a more negative context as is generally the case with people that are as well known and studied as he is. But while the man certainly wasn't perfect, as just like everybody else on the planet, he was only human after all, he most definitely does not deserve the bad rap some people try to give him. And one of the more absurd arguments people try to make against him is that the Walt Disney touch didn't exist and that he's not the real reason why his movies ended up so beloved, with the credit really belonging to overworked and underpaid forgotten employees of his. And let me just say, everything in that last sentence is dead wrong. Because not only did Walt Disney never mistreat his employees and always gave them proper credit, but he was the absolute genius he was often credited as. And the easiest way to prove this is simply by looking at the last movie to ever be released by the Walt Disney Company with his personal involvement in it, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. That short, simple movie proves the magic touch of Walt Disney in a nutshell. And today, while trying to stay as fair, objective, and impartial from this point on as possible, I would like to explain how exactly that is. And spoilers for the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, as well as a few other Disney movies, may abound. So in case you don't want something ruined, you might just want to keep your guard up. This will be your only warning. Alright. So for those of you who'll say I got it wrong and that The Jungle Book was actually the last movie to be released with Walt Disney's involvement, you would technically be right. Especially because The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh wouldn't be released until 10 years later. But here's the thing. The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh is actually what can be considered a compilation movie as it's simply the three Winnie the Pooh shorts Disney had released up until that point stitched together, with the only new portions being the parts that weave the three stories together and the ending. And these three shorts, Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, and Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, were released in 1966, 1968, and 1974, respectively, with Walt Disney personally overseeing the writing and storyboarding process of two of these three shorts. And if you look at the respective segments of The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, you start to see just what made Disney content made by Walt Disney so special. Because many people who've seen the three shorts, either individually or as the movie The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, mostly seem to agree on the fact that the order they're in is also the order in which they're best. Most people love the first segment, Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, which depicts one of the most iconic Winnie the Pooh stories ever, him getting stuck in Rabbit's front door after eating too much honey. But even aside from that iconic element, there's just a wholesomeness to the short that most people can't describe but love about it, with another favorite moment also being his floating up to the honey tree disguised as a cloud while singing a sweet tune. And, of course... Gopher is a hilarious addition. Sure, he couldn't replace Piglet and isn't in the original books, but he still fits the setting perfectly and is rather funny. Really, there's nothing about this short people don't like. 
and pretty much sums up everything people love about Winnie the Pooh in a nice little package. And then there's Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, which is considered right up there with the previous segment. And of course, this being the short that introduced the energetic and bouncy Tigger that we all know and love, as well as the cute and nervous Piglet, only adds to its appeal. Really. Some even prefer this one to the honey tree, and the general consensus is that if it's not on par with it, which it may very well be, the honey tree only edges it out by the tiniest percentage. But then we get to the final one, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, which is where things get interesting. Because while by no means considered bad, and I can't stress this enough, this segment is not considered by any measure of the word bad or subpar, something just seems to be missing from it. Sure, it still has that Winnie the Pooh charm and its share of classical moments, but once again, people generally seem to agree that the previous two shorts just had something to them that they can't quite place that this one doesn't have. So as a result, while still definitely being enjoyable and by no means bad, it's generally people's least favorite of the three. So the obvious question to then ask is, what was so different about the third one? What was it missing that made the other two so beloved and iconic? And the answer to that is a very simple one. Walt Disney. You see, Walt Disney carefully oversaw the making of Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, and things like Gopher and getting the Sherman Brothers to write the songs were all his idea. And not only was the scene where Rabbit decorates Pooh's bottom after realizing he's going to be stuck there also his idea, as it's notably not in the original book, but the final product of that scene was also one of his favorites from anything he'd worked on. In other words, Walt Disney's fingerprints were all over this short, and it shows in just how good it ultimately is. Now as for Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, while Walt Disney had died by the time it was released, he was still very heavily involved in the short's pre-production phase, which explains why it was still able to recapture the magic of the first short so well, because he was still very much involved in critical aspects of its development. And really, a lot of credit also has to go to the casting of Paul Winchell as Tigger. Though not Walt Disney's personal choice for the part and being cast after his death, Winchell proved to be born to play Tigger and quickly turned him into one of the most iconic characters of the Winnie the Pooh brand. And with the perfect foundation already set up by Walt Disney, it's really no wonder why the short is pretty much considered to be just as good as the first one. Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, however, was released and produced long after Walt Disney had died, and this helps explain the missing element many feel this short lacks. Now again, it's still considered good, enjoyable, and wholesome, but just not having that special something the other two had, and thus considered not as good as its predecessors. It's still iconic and beloved, of course, but is still nonetheless thought of as a step down from the other two. In fact, what happened to these Winnie the Pooh shorts after Walt Disney died can pretty much apply to the movies that were released after his death as well. Just like with the first two Winnie the Pooh shorts, the movies that were made while Walt Disney was alive, particularly in the 1960s, were generally agreed to have a special feeling or quality to them, even when the story itself was lacking. Simply put, even if they weren't the greatest movies, 
they still had an undeniable special appeal or magic to them. While the movies released after his death, such as The Aristocats and Robin Hood, while not considered bad or below Disney's standards exactly, lacked that same special appeal and were mostly just seen as average movies and among the company's least remarkable. And I don't think his death and the general reception to the company's projects with released without his involvement after his death is just a coincidence and do most definitely go hand in hand, showing just how important the man himself really was to the success and long-lasting appeal of his animated works. Honestly, the whole reason they probably released The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh as a movie was because they knew they could get audiences to go and see it by being able to show a story at least two-thirds supervised by Walt Disney and thus have his special touch attached to it. One last time in an era where they weren't doing so well without him. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that Walt Disney is the only person who could ever add his special touch to something and make a story good, as the Disney Renaissance and the success of many other franchises prove that talented creators just have a way of making their content feel special when they're personally involved in it or understand another creator's vision. My only point was that Walt Disney was most definitely one of these people, and that the Magic Disney touch was absolutely his own. Sure, he did have plenty of help from multiple sources, there's no doubt about that, but the fact still remains that he was most definitely the genius most people have credited him ha as, and both the movies released before and after his death as well as the obvious differences in the respective shorts of The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh only prove this. Now, I know some might counter this by pointing out that the final segment of The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, which was first seen when the movie was released in 1977, manages to feel much more in line with the first two shorts and captures that special feeling they both have very well. And that is very true. But the thing is, while it's never been officially confirmed, it's generally agreed that this little segment was actually made at the same time as Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, especially because Christopher Robin has the same child voice actor as the one from that short, and for whatever reason was never released until they decided it would make for the perfect ending to the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. And if that is the case, then that would explain why it has that special feeling to it, because Walt Disney would have still been alive to oversee its creation. But I think I've long made my point with all of this quite clear. After all, how much longer can one possibly go on talking about this? Days, weeks, months, who knows? Okay, before that happens, I think I'm just going to end it there. So now I'd like to hear what all of you think. Do you believe that The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, as well as the movies released by the Disney Company in the 60s and 70s, is enough to prove that the magic touch of Walt Disney was most definitely from Walt Disney? Or do you believe it was for other reasons that the special Disney feeling was lost and that it never actually came from Disney himself? Please feel free to let me know in the comments below. And let me please just stress that you are entitled to your own opinions and do not have to agree with the opinions discussed here. I was only exploring the general consensus or how people in general felt about the respective shorts and movies in question, and you most definitely do not have to agree with them. 
You can feel any way about any of these shorts or movies that you want to, and nobody can tell you you're wrong. And finally, thank you all for watching. It is very much appreciated, and I hope to see you all next time.